Hello and welcome to the Mission TV show. This is a special taping we're having at the OCI Leadership Training uh, Retreat. And this is a beautiful, amazing place because we're getting missionaries from all over the world that are taking God's Word as it reads and stepping out by faith and taking the gospel to the world. And we have a very special guest today, the president of OCI, Stephen Grabner. Hi, John. How are you doing? Good. Excellent. Glad to be here. <laughs> Good to have you here. Stephen, what is OCI? What does it mean? Yeah, well, OCI is a family of ministries. Mm -hmm. um, its origin started in the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, see some an interesting picture of some of the previous leaders. This middle person is Warren Wilson. He actually founded OCI. Mm -hmm. He was the president of Wildwood. Okay. And as Wildwood began to spawn new supporting ministries all around the world, uh -huh. people got excited. There was a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it was decided that to help facilitate laity involvement in ministry, it would be good to have uh, an organization dedicated to doing just that. Excellent. And that's really what OCI is. It's our whole purpose is to help lay people fulfill their calling as hands for God to use in this world to fulfill the Gospel Commission. Excellent. And right now our, our main um, focus, in addition to helping individual laity, laity get involved, mm -hmm. is serving those ministries, self-supporting ministries, that are working in some 35 different countries around the world. 35 different countries, wow. Yeah. So it, it just, this has just happened in the last 20, 30 years then. That's right. Yeah, it started in 1982 was actually when OCI was formed. Wow. So a little over 25 years. So what strategies do you use to help uh, lay members get involved with God's work? Yeah, it's several different strategies. It's a great mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Um, part of what we do is hold our, our leaders retreat, uh -huh. which is where we're at right now, uh -huh. which brings leaders together and other interested people together Okay. to hear about what God's doing in different places. Uh -huh. You know, every evening there are different reports right. where you find out, for example, what somebody's doing in Africa, right. where they're ministering to their local community. Right. And sometimes people that are just sitting in the congregation, they're mm -hmm. inspired. Um, for example, last night, mm -hmm. um, after the evening's presentation, an elderly woman who's here, I think she's actually 91, <laughs> And uh, she volunteers in our office. She comes uh -huh. in once a week and helps. Uh -huh. And she spoke to me. She crowded me. And she says, you know, I'm not doing enough. Uh, I need to get involved. Amen. And so, you know, that's one of our strategies. Another way is we um, take mission trips. We have groups visiting our projects. We do a lot of training sessions in different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we hold regional retreats. Mm -hmm. For example, in November, we're going to Colombia. Okay. We'll have a, a training there for lay people. Mm -hmm. well, lots of different venues to try to help laity see, number one, God's calling them. Mm -hmm. Number two, other lay people are doing something. Mm -hmm. And number three, there's something for them to do. Praise the Lord. So there is, there's still room for missionaries. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting you ask that question. Um, I grew up in a Jewish background, and my early 20s, I was converted, became mm -hmm. a Seventh-day Adventist. Praise the Lord. Um, story for another day. Yes. But at that time, I was just seized by this desire to, to be involved in mission work. Uh -huh. And um, eventually, I became a pastor. I worked in southern New England, helped found new congregations. Mm -hmm. But I remember kind of approaching the denominational structure, like, how could I serve overseas as a missionary? Right. And... I guess I didn't have the right um, doctoral qualifications <laughs> or, or qualifications as a medical physician. And there really wasn't just a place for a pastor. Right. What's really amazing with OCI is you have lay people going to different places and doing what they can do. You know, either education, um, trying to change, train children. For example, this is one of our projects in Honduras mm. <clears throat> that was started by a a young 22-year-old man, mm -hmm. helped by a 24-year-old uh, man, mm -hmm. and they just had a vision. And mm -hmm. They went there and they just began to hew something out of this little rural area. Now they have this school mm -hmm. and they have a training program. They're doing mm -hmm. evangelistic series. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really thrilling to see. Wow, that's <clears throat> exciting. So you're, you're basically enabling lay people to, to fulfill their dreams, God-given dreams. Yeah, I, I, encouraging. Uh -huh. Um, facilitating. Uh -huh. You know, it's interesting in the book of Acts, I think right. it's Acts chapter 11, uh -huh. there's an experience where Barnabas leaves Jerusalem 
and he goes to Antioch. And what's been happening in Antioch yeah. was that the converts were breaking the mold. Uh -huh. Instead of just preaching to the Jews, uh -huh. now they were preaching to the Gentiles as well. Uh -huh. And so the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to hear what was happening. Uh -huh. And it says there in Acts chapter 11, I forgot the right, the exact verse, uh -huh. but when Barnabas came, he saw what God was doing, uh -huh. and he encouraged them. He rejoiced and encouraged them to remain faithful. <laughs> That's a bit of what we do. Wow. We, we see where God's working in people's lives. Uh -huh. We go, we try to encourage them, we try to give them tools to do what they're doing better, mm -hmm. and then we try to help other people get involved. Uh -huh. Okay. And all around the world. <laughs> so are there still more needs out there? I mean, you've got, you're in 30 countries. Are there, are there more opportunities? Are there places in the world that still need a missionary? Yeah, are there places that don't need a missionary? would probably be <laughs> a better question. Yeah, the answer to that is, is yes, unequivocally. I think one of the refrains throughout this retreat, all through almost everyone's presentation, uh -huh. is we really could use laborers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a variety of different things. There are medical people um, who are doing different work. There's people that have more pastoral skills. Mm -hmm. There's need for builders. There's need for accountants. Mm -hmm. What a great skill that is. Yes. Um, there's need for pilots. Agriculture. They're just uh, agricultural needs, yeah. farming needs. You know, it, it really, if you go back and you read in the early part of Adventist history where supporting ministries first got started, mm -hmm. I was in the south, southern part of the United States, uh -huh. where Madison, which was okay. the first self-supporting institution, was initiated, wasn't controlled by the conference, wasn't funded by the conference, uh -huh. but it was the only war that Ellen White sat on uh -huh. and gave her endorsement to. Wow. And they had a variety of skills. They taught medical work, uh -huh. but they also taught practical skills. They taught people how to build. Uh -huh. um, they taught people how to farm. Uh -huh. and, so this was a college? Yes, it was. Yeah. So people right. were learning practical skills at a college. That's correct. What was the purpose of that? Was to train to go be missionaries. And they could be and self-sustain and grow anywhere they were pla placed. That's exactly right. It wow. was a self-supporting college. Uh -huh. Again, not a denominational one. Uh -huh. and it had full endorsement and support by Ellen White. And its focus was quick training of uh -huh. people uh -huh. to be missionaries. Okay. And some of their courses, again, were accounting, animal uh -huh. husbandry, uh -huh. farming, uh -huh. nursing, building. Uh -huh. wow. And what's, what's really amazing when you find out the history of it, people came to those schools uh -huh. and then dispersed all across the southern United States, wow. starting new projects. Uh -huh. And you know, that's God's plan. Right. Uh, you know, the, for the laity uh -huh. to say, look, I can do something. Uh -huh. Now today, there's lots of areas, right. not just farming, which is an important skill, but computer skills. Right, that's huge. Yeah, that, for yeah. example, one of our projects in Africa and Zambia, uh -huh. they're intending to start a computer training program in addition to what other things they do. Wow. Just, just to help the local population come up um, to a higher level to, you know, catch more current with the technology that's exploding all around the world. Right, so somebody is really into computers and that's their passion and they don't know anything about farming and not attracted There's to farming. There's still a place for them. There's still a place for them. Mm -hmm. So then, um, how does somebody, you know, step out? How do they start something like this? What's, I mean, like, how do you get involved with OCI and going and, you know, being a part of God's work? Is there a place where they can go and find a need? Uh, a ministry well, where they can join. Well, there's our website, okay. um, which is outpostcenters.org. Okay. And we have ministry needs okay. listed on that website, uh -huh. um, as well as an easy link to our 80-plus ministries all around the world. And then you can click on any of those links, which would take you back to the homepage of that particular ministry. Wow, wow. And it, it's just exciting. I'll tell you a story. Yeah. I was in Colombia about a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the privileges I have is I get to visit a lot of places. It's one of the negatives too. I travel a lot. <laughs> um, but I was visiting a woman who was actually here this weekend. She's not yet an OCI member, but she's going to become one. Mm -hmm. And she had a vision to start a school. Mm -hmm. And she's in the city of Bogota. Mm -hmm. And she's working in an area that's very difficult. A lot of crime. Police don't even go in that area. Wow. A very dangerous part of town. And she's and, there. And she's there. She decided she want to just start a school for children. Wow. So it's like, well, how can I get started? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I can 
I can take five kids. Mm -hmm. And so she did. She took five kids. And then that grew to 10 children. Mm -hmm. Then it grew to 20 children. <laughs> and then she needed a little bit extra means. And so one person would help her and another person would help her. Now she's got 550 children in Your her kidding. facility. She's got this four-story, two-building complex in this slum area. Wow. There's an empty warehouse on one side of her. She's, pardon me, she's wanting to purchase that warehouse. Uh -huh. And it's just amazing, just <laughs> thrilling that um, she's been able to go step by step. And so there's a paradigm. Mm -hmm. You know, you're asked, how can people get started? Right. The first thing is, you know, in what way is God calling you? Mm -hmm. We already yeah. know that God is calling them. That's right. really clear. Matthew 28, go into all the world, make disciples. Exactly. Um, in the book, Education, the chapter, the life work, uh -huh. you know, the task of giving the gospel to the world in this generation is the uh -huh. noblest task that can feel to any, any human being. And isn't that where the greatest blessings are? That's right, yeah. when you're involved in service. Yeah. So we already know we're called. Right, whether now we feel like is, it or not. Yes. <laughs> Now the question is how to get involved. Right. But you, you bring up a good point. A lot of people feel, well, I'm at my job. Right. What can I do? How yeah. can I get out? Yeah. Well, there are ways, you know. Okay. Um, uh -huh. God doesn't call every person to leave their occupation, uh -huh. but he does call every lay person to be involved in ministry in some aspect. Right. You know, um, she talks about, Ellen White does that is, talks about farmers taking a little bit of time from their planting and go visiting their neighbors. Uh -huh. She says this is not wasted time. Mm. Even if you may not make as enough money, as much money rather, right. you know, in your planting, this is not wasted. And so today, you know, we get really busy. Right. Um, <clears throat> technological demands, things calling for our attention all the time. Mm -hmm. But to cut out time and say, no, I'm gonna be involved either in my local church mm -hmm. Or I'm going to step out and be part of a ministry or see how God leads me into a new ministry. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's God's call for There's us. There's a place for everything. God, uh, tell me the, what you see as a difference between heavenly riches and earthly riches. What is each? And how can we invest in <laughs> heavenly <laughs> treasure? Great question, right? <laughs> uh, where your treasure is, there your heart shall be, right? Uh -huh. Or where your heart is, there your treasure be. It works both directions. Right, right. What's the difference between earthly and heavenly riches? Well, yeah. for sure, one last for eternity. <laughs> Which is a good investment. And, and one is transitory. Right. Uh, one is sure. Mm -hmm. And one is ephemeral. You know, we look at what's happening in the markets now, like the stock market's been up since January, so everybody's like, oh, great, great, great. Yeah. But all it takes is a couple of days of decline and everybody's pulling their hair out again. Uh -huh. You know, if our security is based in anything in this world, there's real no, real no, really no strength for that. Right. But right, right, you know, right. to be involved in doing something, it's mm. really, really amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, part of what OCI has done, uh, it's our privilege as well to somehow connect people that are working someplace, can't really take, or don't see their way clear to transition out of their work full time to take them on short term mission trips. Uh -huh. So we have a number of projects where we've done that. This group that went to Brazil last year okay. um, where they worked with one of our ministries there called Amazon Lifesavers. Uh -huh. Great ministry, Brad and Lena Mills uh -huh. working um, you know, in the, on the Amazon River with their medical launch, uh -huh. great couple. And so a number of people went down to help them in their ministry, help work in a church and do different things. Uh -huh. And you know, all those mission trips, they cost a lot of money. Right. There's the airfare, right. there's the housing of the people that come, there's all that. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of people ask me, wouldn't it be more um, efficient mm -hmm. to simply take the money and give it? Right, right. And well, if you're looking for efficiency, mm -hmm. maybe that's true. Maybe your money would go further in terms of hiring a day laborer. Mm -hmm. But there's something that happens to the people that go on the trips. Right. You know, they, Americans... I hope I'm not offensive to your viewing audience, but Americans are very provincial. It's, you know, our worldview is right. the United States. A little bit myopic. Um, yeah, myopic. Yeah. <clears throat> my, a couple months back, my 
I used some frequent flyer miles that I had, and I took my kids and we went skiing for um, at a friend that had a place where we could stay. And uh -huh. anyway, we spent a couple of days skiing. And when we were just about to get on one of the lifts, there was a little sign off to one side that asked the question, "What's the capital of Portugal?" <laughs> Lisbon. So anyway, as we were on the list lift, <clears throat> my son and daughter and I, and there was a stranger, and we were. I, I kind of said, what's the capital of Portugal? Like, that's ridiculous. So we started naming capitals of countries, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And we got stuck at Tajikistan. We couldn't remember the capital of Tajikistan. <laughs> but we listed, I don't know, 25, 30 countries where, you know, we were kind of testing each other. Uh -huh. And then the other guy at the end of the, the lift, he was like, you know, who are you guys? Like, <laughs> how do you even know where these countries are? Right. Now, they, my kids know because they grew up in a third world, we grew up in Africa. We lived there for about 10 years. Mm. And <clears throat> so you, you get a better, bigger view. But Americans are fairly provincial. You, mm. We know the United States. We mm. really don't know very much else. But going on a mission trip expands your, mind. your borders. Yes. It, you begin to interact with a different culture, yes. which is really an amazing thing. Yes. Um, you have to learn to adapt. Mm -hmm. And so taking people on mission trips, it's really as much as it is for the people, right. it's for the participants as well. Right. And that money that they raised to go on that trip, they probably would not raise that money and send it to the project anyway. Actually, that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> it would just... It's really true. It's an easy thing to say, well, I'm going to just give the money. Oh, yeah, will you? Yeah, that's, exactly. That, that's <laughs> Now, I've done some studies and I've seen a drop off in um, over the last 70 years actually in foreign mission giving. Hmm. How do you find uh, the reaction to foreign missions? I mean, it seems like a, a lot of people think a lot of money is going overseas uh, to foreign missions. What's your thoughts about the foreign mission field versus the home mission field? And if you look at spending mm -hmm. in the United States, um, it's sinful. Mm. Um, it's obscene, it's horrific, um, I, you know, in the United States... Give me some examples. Yeah, in the United States we spend more money on pet food than people will give to help starving children. Uh, I thought I came up with that saying. You yeah. thought you came up with that <laughs> yeah. saying? Yeah, <laughs> sounds like this is... I don't know, maybe you heard it in a sermon someplace. No, but, I... Um, uh, it's you, true, <laughs> it's, it's, it's true yes. that... In the United States, statistically, it's, it's there. Um, wow. One of the presenters here at the retreat, she gave a different example. Uh -huh. um, I forgot what it compared with when it was, it's, it's way easier for the humane society to get money to take care of stray animals than it is to help, again, children. And that's in the United States. Wow. And so our priorities are very warped. Wow. And if I could venture, just a little bit sure. into politics. Okay. Uh, again, I hope I don't offend anybody. Go and for it. Try not to get too much of that. But you know, there's a lot good in the conservative side of politics, anti-abortion, standing for life, and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, but one of the great commandments that Jesus gave was compassion for the poor. Yes. And somehow, as Christians, mm -hmm. Christians living in America, we need to examine our lifestyle and say, really, do I really need to live at this kind of a standard of living? Mm. Can I be more self-sacrificial mm. and give to help someone else? Right. So that ties into your question about mission giving. It, there has been a decline. Mm -hmm. But a lot of studies show that personal spending hasn't really declined in the United States mm -hmm. in, in certain areas. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, some people are, are harder hit during this recession than other places. Mm -hmm. But there still is a lot of discretionary spending. And, we may think of nothing of, um, well, I guess I don't want to go into meddling and talk about too many specific things, right, right, right. but how do we use our money? Right. For example, in several places around the world, a dollar a day is what a worker gets. $10 yeah. a day is a high level of high standard of living right. for people. Right. So how much discretionary income do we have? Exactly. And how can we take that discretionary income and put it into mission work, exactly. where it can exponentially do far greater work. Right. And amazingly, blesses us right. in return. Right. You know, it's, um, it's just amazing to think of that reciprocal relationship that God has for us 
He wants us to continually be receiving mm -hmm. so that we continually give, mm -hmm. so that we continually receive, right. so that we continually give. Uh, you, you, you say you've lived in uh, third world countries, and uh, I was wanted to ask you a question. Do you think that the time that Jesus lived in and the lifestyle that he lived, do you think it was uh, more like the way we live in America or the way maybe they live in third world countries like in Africa, India, places like that, as yeah. far as his lifestyle, his conveniences and things like that? One of the interesting way to answer that question, I guess, is to describe in other people's words what happened when they come to a place like Africa where the vast majority of people in the rural areas anyway, uh -huh. they still walk around to get places. Okay. They still use uh, animals for their plowing. Okay. And no, it's changing in certain places. But in the rural areas, there's a lifestyle that's been the same, as you said, since Jesus' day. Uh -huh. And it makes the Bible come alive. Yes. Um, and, and a lot of people that have come on mission trips, they've just been touched by the spirit, the depth of spirituality mm -hmm. in the local people mm -hmm. that they see. Wow. They don't really have very much. Uh -huh. They don't have a fancy home. Uh -huh. They don't have a lot of nice clothes. They don't have a nice car in lots of situations. Uh -huh. Yet they've got a joy and a contentment. Um, let me just tell you a little experience, my wife and I went back to visit Zambia a couple of years ago, and we brought some tennis balls with us. Mm -hmm. They had been donated by the Wellness Center at Southern Adventist University. Mm -hmm. And th these were used tennis balls. Mm -hmm. They didn't bounce so much anymore, but they were really used. Mm -hmm. And we were visiting different people, and we went out to several rural spots well off the main tarred road, about an hour and a half back up these dirt roads up into the mountains. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you're driving through there, kids come out and excited to see an American vehicle and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then we would give them the tennis balls. Mm -hmm. And you can't imagine the joy in their faces of you know, getting this, these tennis balls and how the word would spread. People, kids, further down the road, and we were driving, I don't know how the word got along quite so fast, but there'd be kids like way down the road before we got there, like tennis balls, tennis balls, wanting these tennis balls. Wow. Just... Now, I, if I gave my son an iPad, uh -huh. he'd be appreciative. <laughs> but he wouldn't have the same glow in his face right. that these kids did when they right. got a tennis, tennis ball. ball. And our affluence right. nullifies our appreciation Wow. of things. Wow. You know, we just have so much. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wow, thanks very much. You know, and hey, yeah. Yeah, we'd like it. Or you see a young kid with a, a new toy, you know. Yeah. Like, like it for a couple of days. Yeah, a couple of days, and they say, yeah, okay, you know. Yeah. And, and then I have an iPad, and I take it for granted. It's a tool for me. I use right. it for email and things. But right. we've lost that sense of, wow, we have a lot. Right, right. You know. Another little thing, when I lived in Africa, we lived in a very small house. Mm -hmm. It was entirely comfortable, totally adequate for our family. We had electricity and running water, mm -hmm. which is more than a lot of people in the world do. Mm -hmm. And I felt totally comfortable because, mm -hmm. uh, I hate to say this, I was at the upper level of society there. Yeah, you know, I had a vehicle to drive, <laughs> or I had a computer, and I had a house. So I was at the upper level of society. And I came back yeah. to the United States. I felt within me this whole beginning to compare myself with people, mm. which the Bible distinctly warns us against. And yes. a lot of my friends were at a higher level, socially, status, you know, financially. Right. And, and it's like, oh yeah, you know, my house isn't it. We begin to compare and it's absurd. Right. Because compared with the world, we're abundantly wealthy. So Christ was more like them. Christ was Christ much more like them. Yeah. Um, do you find that this affluence that we've become used to and we've taken for granted makes it more difficult to go and serve? It can really be, you know, an impediment. Right. Uh, how am I going to take my time off work? You mm -hmm. know, it's going to cost me. Mm -hmm. It's airfare. Mm -hmm. But it's really an investment in eternity. Right. It's back to that heavenly treasure. Right. You know, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. In heaven. And by our giving and spending for others, that is what we are doing. Right. We're laying up treasures in heaven. And with this vision, I mean, how should we raise our children? What's, what yeah. purpose should we give them? And that, that's great. You know, what is the purpose that our kids get? 
And if we're only surrounded and we're only uh, molded by the, hey, get a good job, live in a good position, that's what we'll be doing. But if they could see a different paradigm where yeah. service is the purpose for life. And the joy. And the joy of that service. Yeah. yeah it, it totally gives them a different, uh, different flavor, a different focus. Right. It gives them a purpose in life hope for beyond. Yeah. I've taken a number of um, youth overseas and, and, and it blows their mind because they've been told all their life that in order to be happy you have to have a good job, good paying job, good house, you know, that kind of stuff. And they go over there and they find people like these OCI leaders that have given up all that. Yeah. They've had that. They've given all that up and they're happier than any, anybody back home that have all the things that they're told they have to have to be happy. Really it kind of does a big, you know, in their heads and they're, they're, they're not sure how to handle that. One time I was living in Africa, I had a visitor, a guest speaker, we invited mm -hmm. for a session. Mm -hmm. And several times during the time that they were there with us, they mm -hmm. spoke with appreciation for what we were doing, mm -hmm. training Bible workers, um, educating the local people. Mm -hmm. And his comment to me was, you know, I would do this if I wasn't tied down, if I wasn't right. in the system. Right. And Sometimes it does. It takes stepping out of the system. It, it, it takes, okay, I really don't know what the future is going to hold, right. but I know that God's calling me to do this. Right. I can trust God. Yes. He is faithful. Yes. I'm going to leave all that with him. Now in, your, in your ministry, you must have seen a lot of people stepping out of the system, so to speak. Yes. Have oh, yeah. you seen anybody just fall flat on their face and the Lord completely abandon them and they end up worse off completely unhappy, completely angry at God. Have you seen that happen? No, I, I've seen people go through hardships. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, you know, I know families that have lost their children right. in the mission field, which right. is a tremendous tragedy. Yeah. And so there are, there are hardships there. Right. right. But I don't know of any of them, even of those who have experienced that much of a loss, uh -huh. who would not say it wasn't worth it. Wow. They're all still in the field. Wow. You know, um, so they don't end up on the streets begging for bread. They're not no. destitute. I think there's a verse about that somewhere in the scripture. <laughs> <laughs> God promised that that would never happen. Right, and yeah. so you see this as a win-win. Yes, it's for the people, it's for their future, and it's for the people that go. Yeah, they, they, this is actually something that becomes a blessing for for all involved, and a blessing for families. Uh -huh. At least it can be. You know, okay, going to the mission field isn't going to transition you into um, a saint. <laughs> you take yourself with you, obviously. <laughs> Wherever you go, there you are. Yes. But it's just been a rich blessing for the vast, vast majority of people and families that Praise I know who yeah. have gone. I can't think of one individual that we work with that regrets it. Wow. Not one. Wow. And, now, in our office, we're a small team. That's, uh, That's your team. a picture of our office staff. And we try to support the missionaries overseas by communication and things like that uh -huh. um, in a variety of ways. Uh -huh. But really what we do is tell the story about what other people are doing, wow. whether it's in our magazine or whether it's online. or um, We'll go to different conventions and mm -hmm. we try to represent you know, what all of our ministries are doing in different places. All right. So people can see you at ASI conventions. And ASI, GC. Uh -huh. all different places. Uh -huh. So and then tell us again how we can get involved. How can the normal person get involved? Uh, they have contact information? Yeah, well, uh, their first contact information obviously is their direct line to God. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that um, God positioning service. They have that heavenly GPS right. where they can communicate to God directly asking Him, in what way are you calling me into service? Yes, yes. Is it where I am? Yes. Or should I join a ministry? Yes. Or should I start a ministry? Yes. And then they can contact us at outpostcenters.org. Uh, they can call uh -huh. us. They can write us. And they can look on our website and uh -huh. see what our ministries are doing. Uh -huh. and, and we're just a small part of what's happening all around the world. Praise you know, me. it's really exciting yeah. to know that God doesn't stop working while we're sleeping. Yes. He's <laughs> continually moving in hearts of men and women all around the world. So are there still places in the world that are completely dark, where there's no Christian, no, no Adventist, oh, yeah. no Oh, yeah. I mean, just, just last night listening, well, last night listening to one person in Albania, there are Adventists, but it's very small. There's places mm. in Western Africa, mm. you know, the so-called 1040 window, 
uh, the cities of mm -hmm. the United States mm -hmm. where our Adventist president presence is very small. Mm -hmm. Cities are a great need mm -hmm. for somebody to go out and to step in. Praise the Lord. Stephen, it's been such a pleasure having you here. It's been fun and informative and inspiring. And, and I hope that you guys uh, got a little taste of his passion that I think has developed and grown over the years as he's been involved in service. And I'd like to encourage you, along with Steve, to um, get involved, taste and see that the Lord's service, the Lord's work is good. That he, as we enter into his yoke, he begins to carry our burdens and grow our faith and grow our joy as we give what he's given us to others. Thank you for watching the Mission TV show. And um, you can, again, don't forget, outpostcenters.org. Outpostcenters.org is the website that you can go and see what other people are doing, get inspired, and maybe you can start stepping out in faith on God's word that God means what he says. Thank you for watching the Mission TV show, and we'll see you next time.